Okay, it looks like we've kind of got a stable number. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and start. So first of all, welcome. Welcome to this first uh, presentation of MSD at home, Melbourne School of Design at home. Um, it's uh, first time we've tried this. Hopefully we'll be able to get through uh, without any uh, big, big mistakes. Uh, for this first session, uh, we have Jeff Kipnis, who's joining us from Columbus, Ohio, uh, at home. Uh, and I'm broadcasting, as it were, from home, although uh, the background suggests otherwise. This is really, for me, uh, a real treat to be able to, to have Jeff join us, uh, both in terms of the broadcast, but also just uh, to have a conversation uh, for the next hour or so. Um, in putting some of this together, I was trying to remember, and I think it was in uh, 1985, so 35 years ago, that uh, Jeff and I first met, um, when Jeff came to the Architectural Association uh, during the exhibition of a work by Peter Eisenman, Find Out House. Uh, and Jeff was there to do a series of conversations and uh, he joined uh, my students uh, in the studio I was teaching there. And that was really the first introduction to, to Jeff. Uh, and we've had off and on uh, connections and uh, uh, engagements in various ways over the last 35 years since that period. So it seemed to me very appropriate to, to bring Jeff in uh, to this first conversation. Also because I think the work that he does is really at the, um, really in the forefront of, in fact, of a sort of investigations of what are the, the sort of properties and the effects of architecture. Uh, and so part of this came out of, uh, in putting this together, obviously we're in this pandemic situation around the world, uh, people working from home. And so didn't really want to talk very much about that, but I am interested, and this was where part of this, uh, invitation to Jeff came from with the notion of crisis and what does it mean uh, for there to be a crisis, particularly in the realm of architecture. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but it's also how that relates to the question of home uh, and house uh, within architectural discourse. But I'm gonna turn it over now to Jeff. Jeff's gonna, I think, do a little uh, presentation to get things started and then we'll come back and work through some of these uh, themes and issues. So I'll turn it over to Jeff now. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, nice to see you. Nice to see um, Federation Square in the background. Uh, I, I quickly looked at some of the participants and saw some friends. So I'm just gonna say quickly hello to Elena and Toru and Alejandro. So. So the idea when Don um, asked me to do this, he mentioned something about there was frequently a discourse of crisis associated with many of the, um, say Peter Eisen would say, you know, for 400 years, man would do this and then this crisis or that, but there was always a crisis component to many of the calls for transformation in architectural theory or architectural for making as a justification that we need to do something different because this was different. Um, and I understood what he was talking about. And um, I think I might have even participated in it at a certain point in time, but I certainly don't believe it. And I, it's been a long time since I felt anything like that. I've since that time thought of architecture as an internal, uh, as a discipline that has its own internal processes and own internal evolutions. And, and, but I was trying to figure out how can I take up the discussion the way uh, Don posed it to me and see if I could make it relate to some of the issues. Um, bring, it, bring the question, how does architecture engage the world and relate to the world? Um, and so that it doesn't seem so hermetically sealed as I actually think it might be. <laughs> so I decided to go back to a, a, a person I was never that much interested in, except his name is It doesn't even matter if you know him. It was, it was an important 
French Marxist, uh, and he had like his own version of neo-Marxism called structuralist Marxism, and he was trying to figure out what the role of ideology was in um, uh, the formation of individuals. And so he, I'm not going to try to explain to you the theories of um, ideology and Althusserianism, but he, he sort of followed some of the ideas like Lacan did. He was interested in thinking about uh, how language worked, how an individual formed. He put forward these ideas. Let me just put them, tell them. He said, like language, ideology is a, is a fixed structure. We're all sort of born with a kind of structure to, to be formed in an ideology and that that structure had no history um, as it, so we all acquire a particular ideology in our ideological pre-structured capability. Just like we all are ready to acquire a language, we're ready to acquire an ideology. And just like we don't learn language by learning the history of meaning of words or the history of the language, we just acquire the language. So do we acquire an ideology. So in that sense, according to uh, Althusser, ideology has no history. We don't experience it. We, we come into the world, we get formed as, as and in terms of an ideology. We don't experience it as a history. We later on may learn its history. Uh, so I think that's a really important idea. Um, so our sense of what might be a crisis and how to respond to a crisis is already part of an ideology of formation. Secondly, second thing he argued is that uh, it's ideology that interpolate, interpolates us or forms us as it moves us from individuals like organic beings into subjects participating as political subjects, social subjects, existential subjects. So it's this ideological formation that changes us from organic beings into uh, social beings. And I think that's really important because Marx wanted to say, or others before him wanted to say that ideologically imposed upon us false consciousness. And that's the last thing that I wanted to bring to mind from Althusser. And that is, he therefore argued, ideology is not equal to false consciousness. False consciousness means uh, we see the world one way. We think, we think of ourselves in the world as being in a certain way. And that is a fault. We measure ourselves and our relationship to other in false terms that are not true. So if I possess something, a pencil, it doesn't reflect the labor value of the person that made it. I bought it for 20 cents. 19 cents went to the capitalist who, who made the machine, stole the labor. I think you, you follow what I'm saying is an entire ideology of false consciousness. So Marx thought ideology was automatically false consciousness. And Althusser is saying, no, it's a structure that we all assume in the world. And um, that we get formed in the world and that we know ourselves in the world and it makes us concrete as individuals. So I thought this is a really important way to think about this because it allows us to understand, I think what I think is the most important next part. And that is how do we, understand the values that we use to assess our practices. And um, so what, how do we know when we're like six months ago, had Don asked me to do this, we would have been talking about maybe what's, what should we as architects be thinking about the fires in Australia? I'm, is that about right? I know. I remember crying when I'd heard 50% of the species in Australia had been lost. I mean, the, the, it was a devastating story. I couldn't believe it. I followed it 
even more with more passion than this particular story. Next thing I know, I never even heard what happened. Did, it get, did the rains come? I thought it was going to get worse and worse and worse. And then it just disappeared. Uh, and I'm not even sure it disappeared because of COVID. It just seemed to be gone. And maybe before that, I might have been thinking about the changes in the atmosphere, the average temperature of Earth. You know, so we, I, I just noticed that I kept going from one crisis to another crisis. And it was the crisis of the century of the week experience. Um, and so you could feel, in a certain sense, the victim of an ideological structure being supplanted by one after another another and then wondering is it really true that i should be not thinking about architecture is that true do i is that uh and i would go back to my thinking you know is this right and what kept me going is this and that is thinkers really more important as thinkers than me starting with Plato and Aristotle, going to Kant, um, I'll skip a lot, going to Deleuze, kept coming up with a following formulation. And that is the more and more and more they thought, the more necessary they found it to separate three kinds of causalities and three kinds of assessment of qualities. So in Plato, it was the true, the good, and the beautiful. In Kant, as you know, it's the it's pure judgment, practical judgment, and it's pure reason, practical reason, and judgment. By the time you get to Deleuze, it's art, science, and philosophy. All of these have the same thing in common, however, and that is art, let's use the illicit formulation, art, or let's say the beautiful, or let's say judgment. If in all three of these, there's a kind of parallelism. Cannot be subordinated to or made subject to the causalities of science, which cannot be subordinated to uh, and made subject to the causalities of philosophy, despite our efforts. And if you follow that, then whatever you do, whatever you try to do in one of the disciplines to respond to another, to some problem in the world, that you, you can respond to the entire, each of the, I should say, each of these disciplines is adequate to the entire world. And so this is where the last component of my thinking comes in before I start showing these slides. So remember that it's not like each of these disciplines or each of these values takes a piece of the world for itself. It's that each of these disciplines, and this is particularly true by the time you get to um, Deleuze. It's not like science takes a little piece of the world and manages it, and art takes a little piece of the world, and philosophy takes a little pieces of the world. They each have the properties of being monadic. And that is, philosophy understands the world in its entirety, completely, but sees parts of it more clearly and parts of it less clearly. Science understands the entire world in its completely, but sees parts of it more clearly and parts of it less clearly. And art sees the entire world, but it sees parts of it clearly and parts of it not clearly. Does this make sense, Don? Are you following this? So in that sense, Le Leibniz's mon monads had this same property. Each was simple. Each saw the entire universe, but each one could see the universe entirely, but some parts of it it could see better and some parts of it worse. So this monadic perspective became has become my view of 
arts approach of thinking about how to think about art and architecture in its approach to these issues. Okay. And so I wanted to show what it looks like to look at art in a monadic view. All right. And then go back to some of the problems, like what it would mean to think about a world problem. All right. So I'm going to show okay. some quick. All right. So I just, most of the time I look at painting because the painting is so easy, okay? So uh, this is uh, a comparison of a painting by Velazquez and a painting by Manet. This is Manet has gone to Spain, seen Velazquez, is completely taken by Velazquez's technique um, and, and comes back and immediately starts to practice his painting technique to learn how to imitate and master the brush techniques. First thing he starts to concentrate on is the background. So it's called the machination. Ma it means chewing. How to produce a space like uh, man eggs. So the Pfeiffer is a painting. And then in the same thing, same time, he starts to study certain kinds of figures. Now, the reason I'm pointing at this out is an art historian is going to be telling you the whole time in, his, in the conversations about Manet who each of these figures are and what they represent. So the figure on the far right is going to be the wandering Jew. The figure in the middle is going to be the old. So each of the, what we'll be studying is the iconography. Mm -hmm. We won't be studying the way the clouds are painted, the brushstroke. We won't be studying so much the making of the painting as, a, as an atmospheric or aesthetic or a sensation environment. We'll be studying it as a representational environment. And I think that's a great thing. Nothing wrong with that. But like if you look at the woman's dress, I mean, at the... At the uh, I forgot what you call it, but at the beggar, beggar girl's dress... And you look at that way that relates to the sky. And then if you see the man on the right with a top hat on, we'll follow the study of that man. So here he is on the left as a, as a uh, drinker of, um, what's that? See that green stuff in the glass? What's that stuff called? That kind of addicted drink? Uh, yeah, if you hadn't asked me. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so he's a drunk here, and but he's the exact same figure there. So he paints him again, and now he's trying to paint him again. The whole time he's trying to master Velazquez's technique. And by the time he masters it, if you look at the bottom, so this is the V for Velazquez, in the, but it's in the reverse space, and then this is the M for Manet. Hmm. Okay. So he writes his own name in from the point of view of us, and then he puts Velasquez's backwards. So he's painting him, at, he's painting himself playing Velasquez. That's how deeply, so by the time he's t looked at this space, he's finally mastered the uh, Pablo de Valadois, the most spectacular about. So this is the journey, I think, of what a, a good artist or an architect does within the discipline with a historical consciousness. This is mm -hmm. exactly what I'm going to not suggest you don't do. So, I mean, not that this is not what you should not. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this or this is what the discipline calls for. This is right. discipline. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the smoke and the smoke up here. I'm interested in all sorts of stuff. So if you read the analysis of this painting, two, three things will be discussed. All of this iconography, this importation of armament, but more importantly, who is this kid? Because this, he paints this kid over and over and over again, and we're not sure, is it the Ill illegitimate child that he had, or is it the illegitimate child his father had? But all of this work, this painting work that you see here and here, 
that's the work, that's the material I'm sort of interested in because it doesn't belong and that I try to make a kind of accessible. And the reason for that is, is this painting. All of this entire discussion is this way of seeing this painting in relationship to this painting. This is by far and away his most important and most famous painting, Polly's Berger. And what you see is an amazing construction of these mirrors in the background. She's looking straight at us, but I'm him. You see that, Dom? Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's looking at me, but mm -hmm. this mirror has reflected it in such a way that she's actually looking at him, and she's we she's too fat here. Mm -hmm. He has this power relationship over her. Mm -hmm. We see them almost reflected back here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is one of the most complex and sophisticated, not knowing if we're in her head or in, her, in the inner space. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It's thrilling. Yeah. Is this the saddest painting you've ever seen? Or is this a painting about... I mean, is she resigned to the, because at the Follies, the women who served you also served the men in the way mm -hmm. you, uh, so if I go back, about three months earlier, he paints this painting and it's a study. Mm -hmm. um, what I prefer is to think that it's a, this is a diptych mm -hmm. that these both pay that this is exactly the same person at the same time and that this relationship where he's up here now he's down here she's this old is this her are we looking is she this in reality and this is what she's thinking she sees mm -hmm. this constructs what i would call a monadic perspective okay in other words and it's very important that Manet did it, knew it, but didn't think it. Right. Okay. Okay. And unless we start to permit and, in fact, insist on understanding our work, all of our work, uh, that so there is no cause and effect here. This is the this is the way you have to look at the performances of art, architecture, those things that are not science and not philosophy, to actually begin to understand how they're doing the work that they are can do, in order to understand how they engage the world in the way we want them to engage. This is the leap we need to take for the growth of consciousness that I think we are. Um, at the we're at the precipice of thing. this is why for example I think the return to psychedelics is important uh, mm -hmm. to be honest with you I mean I think there's a is a important political history that it was suppressed so much that it became the world's most I mean it was the right uh, LSD was ranked as the worst possible crime by Nixon uh, I'm, you know, I just think it's very important to understand that what it does is takes the ideological structures that we are given, empties them, allows them to get refilled temporarily by a whole other ideological set of placeholders, and then we come back and see the world and understand the contingency and agility of consciousness in relationship to ideological structures, so that the false consciousness ethos is mobilized. And so it's, as, it's almost as if you're turning the reality into art. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why this painting uh, is, I think, maybe the most important painting for me in existence right now. And the reason for that is um, <clears throat> because of this. So this is called Pentimenti. Mm -hmm. um, 
Is you see this little doubling here? Yeah. So Velasquez knew when he painted it, he he painted this out and didn't like he painted it here, had this thing on it, didn't like it, painted over it, and then put a new one here. It's this is a really amazing painting because it's almost it's a painting in the corner. You almost never see in fact I couldn't find another one and if you look in the history of painting, there's not any paintings in corners. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's one of his buffoons, um, very sensitive painting, I think. But he knows he's going to do this. He, he knows that it takes about 20 to 25 years for oil painting to start to thin out. So he knows this is going to happen, but it doesn't matter. So, but it's because of this painting, lots of times we would say, so look at, the, look at all the doubling in this paper. You see these, this is, this is this exact same helicopter. It, it's not two helicopters. It's this helicopter repeated here, right? right. Yeah. And so this is the, this is a um, Venus in her mirror. So, uh, so this is, so instead of, so this is a very famous painting. I'm not going to go through the whole history of this painting, but this is Tracer by Rauschenberg. So this has been painted out. And so it's instead of looking at the mirror, it looks back at us. She's now looking over to there. And then the eagles, there's all this doubling. So much so that you get down here and you see the helicopter again, but you see the helicopter as a negative on top in this zone. Incredible painting, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that makes this the most contemporary painting ever painted because it's now a contemporary painting. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is a historic painting that's experienced Pentamenti. So I don't think this painting, I'm sorry, made this. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of historical view of a reframing of this painting by this painting. Mm -hmm. I think this painting is the newer of the two yeah. and that we have to see it in the monadic perspective. Are you following me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So all I'm trying to say is we need a way of letting uh, the letting art change our being in the world. So it's no longer in it that we are no longer in the phenomenology of the living present of a scientific body in the world. Right. Okay. You know, and so part of that has to do with just thinking in terms of dialectics. So I remember reading um, Glass House Revisited, uh, Ken Frampton's essay. Um, Toto actually blew my mind. I mean, I read that essay. I had a friend explain it to me. It, it was a kind of point by point comparison of uh, Barnesworth with with Philip Johnson. I mean. Literally, it's black and white, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. for me, it just it built my entire understanding of the relationship between modernism and postmodernism. And it was the dialectics, the one and the other, one and two. And mm -hmm. had I known any better at the time, or had I even known how to do it, let's say I needed to add three. Right. And if I'd put Lena Barbardi's, just knew to do that, mm -hmm. the entire argument of one and two goes away. And in right. fact, Lena Barbardi is the two above it together. Yeah. You see how obvious that is? Yeah, yeah. And so this whole dialectic structure, this whole possibility of, you know, parsing the world in that, kind of god awful i mean you know two white men you know it's, i'm you know i won't get into it, but it's i mean when you and to not know about it and to not even know the possibility of it and to discover this uh, and then let's say i don't stop there and i want to get to four right and what i do is i decide you know i need to go to another and you know then i go to kenzo tangi now this is not a glass house. I mean, it's got glass in it, but he uses um, rice 
uh, walls, what we call them, mm -hmm. rice screens. Suji. Uh, uh, but he knew exactly how to build in glass and concrete. He just didn't because of the cultural context. So not only does gender and topography, uh, all the things that Lena Bobardi introduces, but the, but the deep importance of local culture and modernism become part of the discourse. So it just gets more and more and more intimate and dis the discrimination becomes more powerful. And the more you add, the more, I would say, interesting even the quadricourse gets than the, di than the dialectic. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what ends up happening is that the ideology, uh, the dialectic ideology, it's not the it's not false conscious, but if you don't watch out, it does an incredible amount of damage, mm -hmm. and you don't know it's happening. And so, I'm looking at uh, you know uh, this is a, um, Andrew Zago. This is a kind of awful, just a dumb piece of art, I think. I mean, you know, and he works hard on these, and he worked months and months and months, almost a year on these things, and then they become this. I think really very interesting project. Um, and, you know, how do you discriminate this project? And, you know, I, you know, I think about this project and, you know, I could go back and look at its relationship. It's exactly, this is a, it was a magazine and this is what's wrong. You know, this sort of, either binary synchronic dialectic or historic dialectic, what does this help us do? It just reinforces the ideological fixed structure that's always going to get filled. The, the great thing about Althusser's insight is we're going to always fill it. We just get to decide when to start filling it differently and interpolate ourselves into new and let art fill ourselves in the world differently. Hmm. So this is uh, this is Andrew. This is mm -hmm. Elena. Right. Now, Andrew and Elena, I mean, what I love about this is the nuance is they're so close to each other in the researches that it's the nuance becomes transforming. Mm -hmm. Now, if they stop doing what they do and they start putting out fires or building in gestures to diseases, then we lose that. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I look at in 1950, I, did, I took the two pictures out because it's just, and I look at Otto Dick's painting. You know, mm -hmm. and I look at some yeah. post-World War, let's say I'm looking at anti-war paintings in the 40s and late 40s, and I'm looking at um, Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the value of man is better expressed in retrospect or in consequence in the Jackson Pollock uh, abstract expressionism in the gesture, in the in the sense that anything anybody does in a mark is value in itself is far more powerful than any realist effort to depict the value of an individual in a realist painting. Mm. And so the reason I'm not showing them to you is that it will always make, the realist painting will always just look like bad realism and that I should have been able to find a better realist painting. You know what I mean? Thin, the people will look thin or, you know, you, there's just no Basically way to it. make the value of an individual look valuable enough compared to the fact that somebody just put a mark on a canvas, no matter if it was a good mark or a bad mark. And it turns out, Almost all of Pollock's paintings are terrible. 3,000 paintings, maybe 40 of them are good. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
without this kind of, and he knew it. What, why do you think he painted 3,000 of them? <laughs> so just that commitment to discrimination, that understanding that you have, you don't know what you're going to get until you do the, that. So, you know, you, and then Ellen, the, uh, I mean, these are, how do you position yourself? And then, so I see this and you think, you know, this is fantastic. And then I find this bathroom mm, right. <laughs> online. I mean, there, it's not about being original or it's not about being the first to do it or about being on kind. It's about being in contact with the, um, it, for example, what makes this picture is not, it's this. It's not this. It's this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That. And yeah. that. So I started to think about these colors, you know, and then I think, okay, well, here's some, this is a MVRDV. Do you know Comfort mm -hmm. Town? And, um, this is oh, a, is this oh oh I see this is in uh, uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, so this is a real this is a beautiful project by I forgot the name of the firm, a really great firm. But I mean, so these are color. This is color. A real real project in Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's called Mechatronics or something. I should have wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And then you know you look at that and say. So, then I start to think that now I can discriminate because of the misregistration all of which went back to this god awful mm. that you know early mm. stuff and now we start to see it it does real work that matters like mm -hmm. i think the misregistration you can start to see what it's going to do but then now now i'm at 5 and now i'm looking at uh, work in Reykjavik and colored you know it's just mm -hmm. a whole other thing happens if i break down the dialectic if i let the ideology do its work. And I start to see the performances of architecture quite distinct from the performances of building. So the architect, so in building, we're gonna be talking about code and cost and convenience and comfort and pride, pleasure and familiarity. When you're in architecture, you're gonna be talking about display, authority, intimidation, enchantment, sophistication, and perverse pride, perverse pleasure, intellection. So these are completely separate kinds of performances. Mm -hmm. So when you get to five, you start to see something different. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's always, isn't it, that sense that, uh, you know, if you do one thing, it's unique. If you have two, there's a kind of coincidence. If you right. have three, you start to see a pattern. And once you get beyond five or eight, then you really start to understand tendencies and and and, and that's why and uh, some discrimination. So um, so the reason I'm saying this is there's a you know so Deleuze is I picked up the, the art from Deleuze, but there's this great essay by Derrida that almost no one ever refers to. It's called Force Force, and what he does is talk about he he picks up a notion from Heidegger that three is the first number, mm. you know, yeah. one is not really a number and two is just a confirmation of one, you know, I think there's that song one. Is there is by three dog night. Yeah. yeah. Three dog night. Right. Yeah. And what he's saying is actually the only, the real, nothing begins until you, the, the force of four, it's all mm -hmm. about four. Yep. And that's what I thought. I thought, um, oh, drop my camera again. Yep. <laughs> Hey, you drop your camera. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is there is such power in what we do. Uh, and the minute we get distracted by obligations that are the best we can possibly do, is a hand-fisted response um, that we're inept to satisfy because it's not in our area of performance like COVID. Mm. Um, but is that, 
I mean, let me just, because you, you just said, uh, the minute we get distracted, blah, blah, blah. But in a certain sense, I would say that if, if coming from Althusser, the, this notion of ideology, isn't the issue not that we get distracted, the problem is we're not distracted because we're actually caught within a kind of uh, pre-existing uh, condition of, of this ideological position where we're but, doing the day-to-day -day in a regular way. It's how do we not do the day-to-day? -day? You know, the, that, what is that psychedelic moment that, that makes us see it in a different way? I so, I mean, I, so I'm just I, trying to understand it, it, in terms of, you know, because it would seem to me if, if ideology is like language, that is to say it's, it's almost ever present from, from birth, then, you know, it takes a lot of work uh, to, 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 to get beyond the, 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 the ready given, as it were. Uh, and you have to actually see that that uh, you know every you know that your con construct of the world is, has been constructed because you're already present in something a language an environment uh, an ideology or something. So I, as opposed right. to I us think, getting distracted by the day to day, it's how do we see the day to day for what it is? Well, I think I mean I think what his point is or at least the point he makes possible is you're not going to stop. You're not going to get out of an ideological relationship. You're always in one, yep. but you can be agile. You're, you're also not trapped in it. This is yep. when he, this is the idea that ideology yep. is not false consciousness. You yep. can ex with a lot of work. Yep. You can exercise some, um, I won't say free will, but you could exercise some agency in your ideologies. If you understand, yeah. first of all, the kinds of, um, um, uh, what's the word, the kinds of performances, and more importantly, the kinds of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, So not cause and effect, causalities. Okay. The, there are distinct causalities. So the way buildings cause causalities are based on cause and effect. Let's say all the things that are contained in code, safety, um, mechanical, reliability, structural, you know, structural, all the ways the building and we do really well on those things. And I think that's a yep. good thing. So cost, when I, that list, cost, co code, cost, comfort, convenience, plan, yep. you know, all, all those. When you, when you go to display authority, power, intimidation, enchantment, sophistication, that's a different kind of causality. And you're not, right. they're not mm -hmm. cause and effect causalities it's an entirely different one. And you have to respect the integrity and the value of both in parallel. Mm -hmm. And so there's no opposition between building and architecture. They're just two kinds of performances with two kinds of causalities and two ways of value. Uh, and in fact, I think that just that by itself, so you can finally answer what's the difference between a building and an architect, what's the difference between building and architecture easily and without any conflict and without any bemoaning that, you know, that's merely a building. It's not that. You have to be in full respect of a building without there being any judgment about that in relationship to architecture. And it, there may, I wouldn't say that there's no need for argument. It's not true, for example, that every building has it or doesn't have it. It's just like not every piece of clothing is, you know, clothing. I won't say fashion, but, you know, not every piece of clothing matters as clothing. Right, right. Uh, but you can make clothing matter. Yeah. And when it matters, it can matter a lot. 
So is this, I mean, is, is that where, because I, I had put down um, what your, I think one of the recent uh, books that you worked on, the one for, for Eisenman, uh, um, you had a quote from Bataille, uh, Bataille's definition of architecture. Right. <clears throat> and again, where he talks about, uh, you know, uh, imposing silence on the multitudes and so on and so forth. And it is interesting that I had, had seen in a, in a certain way the same formulation through Alberti. When Alberti talks mm -hmm. about the difference again between building and architecture, that architecture is really that that's beyond just keeping the rain out, keeping something up, keeping comfort and so forth. And in fact, he talks about um, that, you know, in fact, that architecture is only really temples and, uh, you know, great works of sort of civic architecture. And in fact, didn't consider the house to be a piece of architecture at all. So that was one of the questions or one aspect I wanted to raise a little bit, this degree to which, you know, now that may be at a particular time historically, but the, because, you know, the work of Eisenman, the work of Hayduck, everybody's doing house series, you know, as the sort of architectural act. Uh, but in a certain way, is that relationship, because it's a house and therefore it's supposed to be a home, it's always putting it back into this uh, moment of dispute between is it architecture or is it just a house? Is it just a building? Well, uh, if it's just a house, then you've already answered your own question. Um, right. But if you make the house perform like architecture, then you've... So, for example, Hadix buy houses. Uh, mm -hmm. How much time we got? Well, we're, we've got about 10 more minutes, but if we want to get a few questions uh, and stuff in, then we'll need to I mean, I, open it uh, up. I, I, I never know how long I'm going to talk. I, I brought some quick examples of... I, so, one of the things, one of the mistakes, we need to be careful about the damage we do. Hmm. Okay. One of the damage things we do is to create a relationship to our local condition. That's too comfortable. Hmm. Okay. And we do that by uh, making nice views, let's say, hmm. or, by uh, domesticating all of our sensations in relationship to our domestic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to just show some houses that I thought had challenged that in a couple of ways. But, you know, like if I say, Hadix buy house, if you look at the teardrop window, mm -hmm. I mean, at the window, so there's, you know, the one I'm talking about. Yep, yep. And it constructs a kind of um, awkward relationship, you know, and the nice thing it does is also reveals the effect of the ribbon window and the framed windows in relationship. So you go and, you know, you and I both know it's about the passage of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so you go through those three rooms, you go out, you go back. And so in each case, you've gone from one time to another, from the past to the present to the future, and you're not sure which is, I mean, it's a very interesting thing, but it shows you very quickly um, how just a simple effect, like the way you look out of a window into the, into, and how high you are up can give you a sense of power and control and uh, at ease and so let's say I'm on TV, I'm watching on TV and I see the horrors and whatever. And the next thing I know, I cut that off and I'm looking at my window or I go out my pleasant yard or I walk around. The architecture has done everything it can to, to immunize me from my relationship to, uh, so I know it. The television has informed me. I feel bad about COVID. I feel bad about, Syria, the refugees in Syria, the, this problem that everybody was worrying about in Europe, all these incredible refugees that were, remember this problem? Ten yeah, yeah, it's was pumping like, the, the yeah, Equal to yeah. your fire. Where's the yeah. problem now? Where's the discussion of the problem? 
you know, 400,000 people or a million people starving to death in Syria now. We don't even know about it. Right. We don't know about it because it's not on TV, and we don't know about it because we, we cut off TV, and the House reassures us that in our local parochial circumstance, we're fine. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. Now, I don't, I don't think we should have sewage in our house. So I was looking at, uh, I was looking at um, uh, the house by Lowe's for, uh, what's her name? The singer. For, for Josephine Baker? Yeah. So she has the pool in the house, you know. Yep. Um, so I was thinking there's an incredible opportunity to have something. So she's looking at that. You could put Damien Hurst's shark in there. You could put dead bodies in there. I mean, you can, you know, it's a viewing tank, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to yeah. be her swimming in it. But there's ways to think of mobilizing real sensations, real sensuous experiences that are not always um, domesticating, that are not always anesthetizing, that are not always, you know, that have a full sensation, have a full uh, awareness that, that, that at the same time don't have to be assaulting us like television images and stuff. And that there should be a way that architects take the time to experiment with that understanding the damage they do just to make us feel just in the sense that they're making us feel secure right mm -hmm. okay well let's why don't we we've got a few more minutes why don't we see if if anybody is interested in raising a question hi jeff um i was just wondering how committed you are to this idea of discomfort is there a is there a role for comfort to play in our lives as citizens so that we're then positioned to be more active and productive in the world um have you removed the sewage from your own home um and if if not why not no i'm a fraud um <laughs> I, I, i'm a theorist uh i'm you know, you have to be careful. Uh, discomfort, dis, I'm going to spell it D-I-S-C-O-M-F-I-T-T, -T, discomforting. So discomfort, I do think there's a difference between, remember, don't turn art into politics. Don't turn art into, like, I. it's a very different thing to say, and I, I think it's very important that you understand the difference uh, uh, or that you know should we all have exactly the same amount of calories around the world before anyone else gets any extra calories no i don't believe that because i do i think an economy is based on disequilibrium but i understand what happens when there's a uh, politically installed unfairness so for example uh, there's enough food being produced in the world to feed everybody on the planet, yet there's starvation all over the planet. I don't know how to answer. I don't know. You know, it, it, it drugs you into comfort. There's a difference between comfort and drugging you into indifference. Jungles are more valuable than monocultures. I, there's nothing I believe more than that. More people doing diverse practices is more valuable than everybody trying to solve one problem, whether it's hunger or poverty or COVID. We, if it, the, because more genetics gets produced by more diversity in a jungle than monocultural production. So you have to trust people move to the city until 1850, knowing that the, being fully aware that the death rate was higher in the city than it was in the countryside, but they moved there not for economic opportunity, but because the number of existential niches was higher. They could do what they wanted to do and be themselves more in a city, not because they could, earn more money. 
I think this is. And do, you, and do you think that's true today? Or do you think that's changed? Because I mean, you know, clearly the urban condition is the now prevalent condition. Yeah, I think, uh, I do think it's true, but I do think, for example, you had Korea and China um, not forcing, but um, moving a labor force into an urban setting and then in order to um, staff factories mm -hmm. um, for as an economic decision. So it, it was a decision. So Korea did it. And then China, China moved 70% of 60% of its population in 40 years from past. I mean, from, um, you know, uh, farm settings into industry into the, to build their industries. Yeah. So the most important building type is the factory, uh, and the and putting people into those settings meant building house housing and factories, and we don't really discuss that. Um, and yet their entire, and they're happy about that. Mm -hmm. So one of the real questions about, for example, one of the questions that you'll find every sociologist asking when it comes to an ideological problem is that why are people that are victims of false consciousness satisfied with it, happy with it? Why don't they, why, why don't they resist their lot in life? Why don't okay. they revolt? Yeah. We have, a, we have a, I think, a question from Laura Brown. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Okay. First of all, um, go Buckeyes to Jeffrey. And um, I'm curious, you've mentioned philosophers and then you just made reference to sociologists. What electives would you recommend that students be taking outside of architecture to have a better well-rounded understanding of not so much the architecture but i feel like humanity how people experience the world um okay could you repeat that one more time sure um you've mentioned philosophers right and also sociologists and i'm wondering what electives you would rec outside of our architecture you might recommend for students art <laughs> um, you know uh, that's such an interesting question here's what I here's what I'm going to say to you because this is what I really believe I used to would have said an answer and it would have gone something like um philosophy, economics. It would have been an answer associated with my interest in the way those interests intersected the world through architecture. Now, I think it's important that a student that's interested in architecture explore whatever a, an intense parallel interest of any sort, mm. as long because um, it, for example, race car, it could be car racing. It could be, um, I don't know, archery, television. Um, and the reason for that is, is it's actually the, what it's cultivating the levels of, dis of discrimination and connoisseurship that's, I think, the most important thing because you import that, you will import that and translate that into, so you need several practices. You need one area of expertise and then you need several, you know, could be film. I mean, it would be, for me, film was everything. Art and film was everything and, and music. I mean, I haven't even mentioned music because I don't want to get off on it, but so, probably film and music and and uh, did more for me because I was studied science as, but I could, I, like I, 
would be impossible for me to say you need to know music uh, to even begin to think about the world away properly, but that's kind of how I think. So what I really, so whatever, okay. So the answer I'm gonna give you goes like this, all right? It goes like this. Only fools and fanatics confuse passion for the truth, all right? That's a statement I believe. But you need to understand that that's a statement in favor of fools and fanatics as much as it is a statement in favor of the truth. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll take one or two more. I see uh, there's uh, Jimmy. Uh, Jurisovich. Yes. Jurisovich. Yeah, yeah, close. Ah, we're not close. Hey, <laughs> tell me the right one. Yurisovich, but um, yeah, just is it Yimmy? <laughs> no, they gave me a hot J at the start. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around a little bit this kind of position you present. Hey, Jimmy, let me interrupt yeah. you one second, okay? Yeah, then I want to tell Laura something else that's true. One of the biggest influences on my life philosophically, I swear to God, this is true, is stand up comedy. Okay, mm. now you can tell. Now you can. <laughs> so, I guess like it's wrapping my head around presenting this idea of multiple approaches of at the discipline without necessarily reacting to what is happening now, right? Which is kind of how I'm understanding. And in a way, like I, what what scares me about it is it seems a little defensive, and and. I guess willfully ignoring some of the problems could be like a way of reading it. Um, and I just wonder if that, like you could talk a little bit about that maybe. Yeah. Um, so if you're working on something and you, in, in your discipline, you'll know the, you'll be able to circumscribe the problem and also the participants in the problem, if you're in a discipline. If you then, if something comes up outside the, you know, some event in the world, I'm asking you, how do you stop and turn your attention to that from the point of view of the discipline? So the most, the most famous examples that are often given are medical, um, like, the response to tuberculosis and the tuberculosis hospitals, um, you know, which in, had to do with ability to be disinfected and introducing light and sunlight. Um, and so there was this real effort to try to respond to the community, the professional community of medical professionals with the qualities of architecture with a real dedication, because there was no way to put out all the, there was no other tools. They, there was one tool set, um, and they did the best they could to apply those tools to no avail. And so, however, what they did was produce a new style the style inhabited the imagination, and I showed you some examples of the style. It also, by the way, caused a great deal of um, friction and took on its own life and, can, and then went back and continued to evolve within the disciplinary fabric. And so the, your question would have to be joined by a case in which you know of a case in which there was an ability to stop, lay down your tool set, pick up a, and then pick up the problem and then, then apply a problem solving technique to it from the point of view of a discipline. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, I can't give you that example. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I tell you what, I've tried to find, you know, like, um, 
but I can give you the other thing is I can give you so many examples from so many disciplines of people in a discipline just doing the most obscure, totally unbelievably pointless research that turned out to be solve gigantic problems in the world like Lobachevsky's non-Euclidean geometry and, or like the uh, black body radiation problem. So in mathematics or in science or the collegno in uh, the Symphonie Fantastique where um, you have to turn the bow over and play with your wood, play with the, you know, when you play, you, to make a certain kind of noise. So there's so many of these things that ended up that just, that were pointlessly, I don't know, trivial, frivolous uh, exercises in conceits of a discipline that ended up having really profound effects and way past the disciplinary boundaries in the long run. Lots and lots and lots and lots of examples, but going the other way, not many, none that I can think of. So Jeff, let me, let me jump in there. In, in that case then, and you know, as I said at the start, I've known you for 35 uh, years, uh, and I'm assuming that your time in architecture is just a slightly longer than that. So in that 35 years, based on what you just said, it would seem then what we would be looking for is far more differentiated work, uh, development, testing, propositions, and so forth. Uh, you know, following obscure tracks and obscure lines of inquiry. Do you think in this last 35 years, there's been more of that or less of that over 35 years? To me, yeah. uh, I think it's been an explosion. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, and I've tried to make this point before, it's like the Cambrian explosion, and that is almost all of it has been bad. Right. I mean, not bad. All, almost all of it's been a dead end. Right. You know, and but I think that, that's. Good. I think it's one. It's a. It. It appears to be a dead end so far, but perhaps like some of the other work, it, at a certain point, one will find that actually what looked like a dead end is actually quite productive. Or, are you in favor of at the very least that explosion? has the possibility of creating a more diverse sort of ecology yeah. market. I mean, I, so when I made the, I did a lecture a long time ago, I don't, I don't commend it to anybody, but so I looked at the structure of the Cambrian revolution. It's a moment in time when an, an inordinate number of new body types occurred in biology. And there were three components to it. And, um, it was kind of like a new chemistry, a new, a new economic, a new possibility of building bodies, a new economics, a lot of food, and also a new, uh, so new resource, a, a, a combination of three circumstances. And, and you could find that exact same analogy that was more stronger than an analogy starting in uh, 1990 in architecture with digital methods, digi uh, CMC production. And so the reason you, you found some, a kind of explosion of experimental bodies, so to speak, was similar. You know, it was a little bit like it didn't have any resistance and it had a lot of production possibilities, but it also had no way to, um, there was no discrimination. No, and so all those bodies died because only a few could, it wasn't that they were bad so much as that they're just only a few would could keep going. Um, and so since the time of the Cambrian explosion, the numbers of species continues has continued to decline. 
and I think that's probably more or less going to be true because there's no, you got, you have to have a new resource to change mm -hmm. that. Um, and I think what you see, however, is increasing refinement and increasing sophistication and uh, unbelievable levels of discrimination. Uh, but you know, to somebody outside, you may see it. You may see things have gotten less and less interesting. So it's like, it's actually pretty well thought out, I think, by in the structures of scientific revolution, even though he's later on recanted it and revised it. But you know that book. Um. All right, look, we're at one uh, seventeen now. So we've gone a little bit over what we thought we would do. But we'll wrap it up there. I want to thank Jeff Kipnis very much from Columbus, Ohio. I know it's way past his bedtime, so he's taken a nap earlier in the day so he could stay up this late to have a conversation. Well, it's been us. fun. It's been fun. It's been great. And uh, it's actually really good to see you. It's, you realize too. it's a lot easier to do it this way than trying to get you on an airplane. So yeah. we may well, have I to can't come back there anymore, there. you know. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> Well, listen, thanks to everybody who joined in. We very much appreciate it. Uh, we will do another one of these. Uh, we're planning to do another one of these next week at the same time. Uh, that information will be posted as soon as we get it all arranged. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And again, thank you, Jeff, for uh, giving us an hour of your time. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Bye.